All right. Well, um, hello, everyone. Uh, actually, good evening. For me, it's a good morning. Um, my camera didn't work for some reason, so I'll be talking without my video. I hope that's okay. Um, and thank you to everyone who organized this, and I hope uh, the students will learn a lot and I'll be able uh, to answer any questions that you have that you might be interested in uh, about studies in the US. So my name is uh, Aydin Shaktaktinsky. I finished my uh, bachelor's in geology at Azerbaijan State Oil and Industry University, and I'm cu currently doing my PhD in geology at the University of Houston. So today um, I will be talking about studying abroad and specifically um, my graduate experience in the USA. So I watched some of the Ilgar's webinar and I saw that he covered uh, a lot of important things on how to apply and get admitted to US and what is it like to generally do uh, research in the United States. So uh, I thought that I would do my presentation more about the University of Houston, how the schools in the US are organized into colleges, schools, and research groups. Um, I will touch on my own research work, and I'll talk about conferences and publications. I also wanted to touch on the coursework uh, that you can take as a geologist. And uh, also, I will talk about the teaching assistantship, uh, which is kind of a part-time job that you can do here as a student. And that's from the academic uh, standpoint of view. Uh, from professional activities, I would also like to talk about um, student organizations, the intensive recruitment season that is happening in schools, um, career fairs, info sessions, and how to get um, interviews and potential internship opportunities in the States. So I go to the University of Houston, which is located in, um, in Houston, in Texas as you can see here on, here on the map. Um, this is a huge university. It's actually a system of universities in Houston. So there's five campuses. Of course, there's a main campus that you can see here uh, on the right side. Um, and this is where I go to. And you can see Houston here in the, uh, in the background in the, the, the downtown of Houston. So uh, the really cool thing about the University of Houston is that it's located in um, Houston, right, which is the energy capital of the world. So there's a lot of activity going on here, a lot of networking opportunities and um, a lot of ways to connect with the industry. So this, uh, this main campus, it has 16 academic colleges. There's around 50 departments and each department has its own uh, research center. So if you think about like the main research centers, there's around 29 of them. And there is a massive number of students. There's more than uh, 50,000 students just in the main campus itself. And I think around 70 to 80,000 in the whole uh, system of UH. Um, there's about 100 master degrees, uh, about 50 doctoral degrees. And there's more than 11 sports. Um, you might know that sports in the United States is really big. You know, every Friday or Saturday, there's competition between different universities. So the whole campus gets um, really busy. And uh, the cool thing is that there's a lot of useful uh, campus resources. Um, there's libraries. Um, so certain libraries have their own um, uh, certain colleges have their own libraries, but also there's one um, libra main library on campus, which I will show. Uh, there's a huge recreation center. Uh, basically, it's like a gym and you can find anything you, you ever wished for in that gym. There's inside pools, outside pools. There's even a, a stage for people to come and train for uh, Olympics as well. Uh, there's a health center, um, so if you have any issues, you can go there and get treated. And I think the cool thing is, I haven't used it myself, but there is a service for, um, uh, like, uh, uh, you can uh, book a therapist or even get a, a psychologist. You know, if you're having, if you're stressful, and uh, so I think it's a it's a useful resource to have on campus. Um, there's many food courts with you know a lot of food options. Uh, housing. I was surprised that. Um, just on this campus itself, there's 10 different uh, student apartments. So it's very convenient to live on campus, although it might be a bit expensive, but uh, there's a lot of options at the University of Houston. And um, also there's a, a police department, uh, which is located just on campus. So in case there's any you know, issue with safety or something, you can um, always call them. Um, so I've included here a quick link uh, for those who would be uh, interested to look at it later. Um, actually, I'll open it uh, real quick. Hopefully it goes there. Yeah, so if you come here, um, there's last year our university did a really cool thing where they um, 
basically droned the whole university. The university of Houston, a tier one and uh, they basically, you know, created a virtual tour of the university. So for anyone interested to see what it looks like, uh, you can come here. And on the left side, there's going to be, you know, a lot of different parts of the campus that you can go to. Um, so for example, I wanted to show you the, the main library. Um, so this is the main library. It's called MD Anderson. It's actually, it looks small, but it's actually 11 floors. Uh, and each floor has a collection of books, study rooms. You can get your own individual study room or you can get a group study room um, with, you know, screens, computers. Um, there's separate room just for computers, separate room just for studying. So there's tons of options. I used to go here a lot uh, during the first year, but also as students, we get access to the digital library. So we get um, access to uh, different journals and papers. So you can uh, just be in your uh, office, uh, wherever it is on, on campus, and you can log into your computer and then log into the library and basically use the same resources uh, from your computer. Um, and in terms of the campus itself, yeah, there's again a lot of resources and um, I wanted to show you one of the places that students usually um, get around a lot and you might have seen it from my uh, stories that I share. It's uh, this place here, very cool place. You can just, uh, you know, go and study outside if you like, or just get together with your friends um, and just enjoy the view. Okay, so back to the presentation. Um, so, uh, I told you there's 16 colleges and I'm in the College of uh, Natural Sciences and Mathematics, uh, which you can see here on the right side. And we have about six departments. There's uh, biology, chemistry, computer science, math, physics, and the earth and atmospheric sciences, uh, which is where I go to. So in our department, uh, EAS department, we have about 5,000 5, undergraduates, around 1,000 graduate students, um, 60 faculty members. Um, there's about 60 TAs, teaching assistants, and uh, 50 research assistants, which are students. Um, there's 17 masters and PhD options uh, that you can take in geology, geophysics, and atmospheric science. And the annual expenditure on research is about uh, $31 million. So uh, let's look closer at the uh, at my department, Earth and Atmospheric Sciences, and the research uh, that we guys do. So the research is tailored to um, three main topics. There's Earth and uh, planetary dynamics, uh, which is like global scale or large scale uh, research. And then there's Earth surface systems, just studying the surface of the Earth, you know, using satellites or uh, studying the climate. And then there's urgent, uh, Earth uh, energy and Earth resources, which is basically focused on um, extracting, exploring and extracting energy uh, from the Earth. So it just, in our, just in our department, we have about 20 uh, research groups. Um, so here we have on the right side, I've just put some of them here, uh, some of the biggest ones. For example, there is a, a center for tectonics and tomography. So these people, they use earthquake tomography to image um, the subsurface of the earth all the way from the crust to the core. And they study, you know, how plates have moved, have, have moved throughout time. Um, during the tectonic history of Earth. Um, there's also the Conjugate Basins Tectonics and Hydrocarbons Consortium. This is an industry consortium. So these people, um, they study, uh, they basically do basin analysis along the coasts of uh, South America and uh, Eastern South America and Western Africa. And they basically do exploration type studies where you know they study the tectonics of a certain basin and uh, look for hydrocarbon prospectivity in that region. What kind of structures there are? Is there any potential um, hydrocarbons and so on? Let me turn on my um, laser pointer. By the way, can you guys hear me okay? I've been talking for some time now. Uh, it's quite perfect, I don't know. Okay. And okay. I actually noticed, uh, since I already took a voice, uh, if you allow me, uh, please not forget to, to share with us on insights on the last but not least lab, which is uh, sounds uh, geophysical lab. I have never myself heard about like universities having such a, you know, 
a discipline like sans actually i'm in mean, or a lab like sans geophysical yeah. so if, if you if you are informed by some means about that yeah. i would have to, to be that well. <laughs> yeah i guess maybe you thought that sun is like literally the sun right or it's actually uh just the professor's last name <laughs> <laughs> so that professor basically has his own lab called Science Geophysical Lab, as, as far as I know. <laughs> so, yeah. um, so there's also the Center for uh, Petroleum Geochemistry. Uh, I think it's considered number one in the world uh, because they have a very sophisticated uh, built-in lab with all kinds of tools and um, workstations to uh, study shale geochemistry. So they, they can basically study kerogen in detail. Uh, they can study oil samples and everything related to, you know, petroleum geochemistry and kind of do basin modeling type studies. So a lot of the industry people come and, you know, do their samples here. There's also a applied sequence and biostratigraphy program. So this is more like uh, studying the age record uh, of the earth using fossils and you know, biostratigraphy. Um, and of course we have very, very, very strong uh, geophysics people. Uh, some of the uh, world famous geophysics professors and uh, some geophysics labs. So here we have the allied geophysical laboratories and uh, rock physics laboratory. Uh, basically these people, they use, again, this is more energy based. So uh, industry based. So they, um, you know, they get projects on seismic and well data, which they tie together to, you know, study the rock properties uh, at the reservoir level. Um, so yeah, you can, uh, get familiarized with uh, all of the research labs that you're interested here from this list. Um, but um, the, the lab that I go to, or I'm part of, is the Remote Sensing and Geospatial Analysis Lab, which you can see here in this logo. I so, think, yeah. Uh, before I jump into that, would you please also expand just a little bit more about how you uh, end up being exactly in Remote Sensing Lab? Because mm -hmm. there are almost 20, 25 labs. So what right. is regular procedure that, for example, you are not in one, but you are in another one? Yeah, that's a great uh, question. And uh, I know probably a lot of people will be interested in that. So uh, let's imagine, right, you're in Azerbaijan and you're applying to universities in the United States. Uh, let's say, you know, you apply to like uh, four or five universities. Each one has its own uh, department, each department has its own research lab, each research lab can have one or two professors. So there's a lot of options, right? So you have to go off with basically, what are your interests? What do you want to study? What do you want to do the, for the next um, two, three, five years, right? And what were your, what was your undergraduate experience? What kind of uh, topics were you involved with? Did you do research? So usually you, you choose something, something that was uh, related to your research or something that you haven't done, but you're interested in, but you still want to have something, uh, some experience related to it. So that when you talk with the professor, you can see that, you know, uh, you're, a, you're a valuable asset to the group, right? So there ha you have to have some experience in that topic or in that area. Uh, for me, I didn't have any experience in remote sensing actually, but I worked a lot on uh, outcrop analogs and you know doing uh, characterization of outcrops doing reservoir type studies so this group uh, one of their projects or one of their main topics is uh, using remote sensing for you know imaging of uh, outcrop analogs so that was like one thing that I could connect with and you know I reached out to the professor and we talked and uh, uh, it, it worked. So um, I could potentially also you know apply to the basin analysis um, because this is basically you know uh, petroleum exploration which is what my undergraduate degree is right. So you just go off based on you know your um, your background and the way it works is you you, you can either write an email or you can call the professor. And in the email, you talk about a little bit about your um, background experience. And then um, you mention to the professor that you're interested in his research, you know, that you have read his papers or uh, just show him that you know what kind of work they're doing and see if he's interested in you. And then the rest is just, you know, conversation between you and him or, or her and um, how that goes. I hope that answers the question. Yes, thank you. Thank you okay. very much.
Cool. Uh, yeah, just uh, one thing I would suggest to the students who will be who, who would be interested in applying is please, uh, please do an extensive search of their website. So each research group, uh, they have their own website, or at least they should have their own website. And even if the research group doesn't have its own website, the professor will have something in his resume uh, or on his own web page uh, on the university profile that will have something about his research, right? So it's very important to first read about his research interests, then go to his um, research group web page, look at all their activities, what they did in the past five years, you know, most recent time, look at the papers they've published in the recent time. Um, are these papers that interest you? Is this something you want to do when you join the group? And then um, look at um, their support. Like, do they have industry support? Are they based off of funds? You know, is the industry, does the industry have an eye on them? And then, um, also, it's important to look at the students in this group. So students are, who are already research assistants, um, usually they will have a profile that says people. So when you click on it, it will show you the people that they have in the research group. And you can see what kind of students this professor is interested in. So you can you know, try to tailor your application towards that as, uh, as well. Okay, so um, now I'm gonna be talking about our research group, uh, which is Remote Sensing and Geospatial Analysis Lab. So there's there are quite several projects that we've been doing um, in the past, you know, that they've been doing in the past 10 years, but the most recent projects, they can be divided into three parts. Uh, there's 3D outcrop imaging, uh, which is basically using remote sensing tools to create 3D outcrop models. There's a new a new tectonics and earthquake hazards, which is using satellite data such as you know sentinel aster uh, landsat satellites to basically image a certain region like on a larger scale and then you can classify it for you know the surface lithology and you can use tools such as radar uh, which can actually measure the movements on the surface so you can study present-day tectonics and integrate with gps to study you know earthquake movements and hazards and another focus is surface deformation. So, you know, some faults, they have surface expression and this affects, you know, the roads and stuff. Um, so another focus of this research group is to use, again, satellite data or, you know, ground-based data to quantify the deformation on the surface of the Earth and kind of talk about potential hazards in that region. Uh, so for me, I'm doing uh, 3D outcrop imaging and to do this, we have uh, several tools. You can see here on the right side, we have a DJI hexacopter, uh, which is basically a drone, and you can mount it with a camera. Then you go to an out outcrop and scan it from many different um, uh, perspectives and angles, and then stitch it together to build an outcrop model. Um, I also use satellite data. Again, this is for uh, regional context. Uh, a terrestrial laser scanner. So this is a, a ground-based system which you can place in front of the outcrop face and just scan it and create a point cloud, um, a three-dimensional point cloud uh, of that outcrop. Uh, we also have a very expensive tool. It's called hyperspectral cameras. So this tool, it can, um, this is basically a camera. It, um, it takes the energy from the sun that hits the outcrop and comes back to the sensor and it records the reflectance of the materials on the surface of the outcrop. So each material has its own, you know, reflectance value and based on that value, we can classify the mineral on that outcrop surface. And for geophysical kind of studies, we have a electromagnetic profiler to study the electric properties in the shallow subsurface. And there's a ground penetrating radar uh, to study the acoustic properties in the shallow subsurface, you know, uh, kind of similar to seismic. Um, so my research work, uh, it kind of consists of two, two components. Uh, there is a field component and a lab component. So in the field, uh, we, let's say we chose an outcrop location of interest. Uh, we would go there with a truck, with, with our tools in, in, the, in the back of the truck. And usually, uh, uh, most of the, some of the uh, outcrops in the, in the, in the states, they're, um, maybe you've seen, they're like uh, interstates or highways. And along the highways, you will have a, an exposed outcrop, right, from, from when they were building the road. So usually you would park your car opposite to the, to the road of the outcrop. And then you place your tool on the back of the truck and you start scanning uh, the, the outcrop, right? Um, it's kind of a, 
it's kind of risky because you're on the side of the road, but it's um, you also have to be fast because cars are always passing by. So you, you need to be able to capture the moment where it's relatively less noisy. And then uh, in the field, we'll also collect samples and then you can uh, uh, bring that in the laboratory. And we have a setup that some of the previous students have built in the lab. Uh, basically, this is a stage that moves horizontally left and right. So you can place samples here and the same hyperspectral cameras are placed on top. So you basically scan the samples. You can place up to, you know, 30 samples on this and scan it at once. And basically this, uh, the, the, the data that you're getting from these samples will be used to kind of ground truth or quality check uh, your data collection in the field, right? So from this, we can get a dense point cloud, which you can uh, triangulate with the images you took in the field and kind of uh, stitch them together to produce a, a digital outcrop model. So the cool thing about these models is that you don't have to go back to the field. Um, you can literally open it in your office on your computer. You can zoom in as much as you want. Uh, it's almost the same as if you were in the field. Again, it just depends on the quality of the images you took with your tools. Um, but uh, you can view it from any perspective. You can rotate it any way you want. And most importantly, you can do actual measurements. So you can measure dip and strike. You can measure lengths, widths of all the uh, layers, uh, true stratigraphic thickness, and you know all kinds of different stuff. Um, yes. Sorry to interrupt you. Uh, but uh, I'm just wondering, like, since uh, you're also in Houston, and we all know that the NASA is in Houston, you know? Yes. But your uh, direction is a remote sensing laboratory, mm -hmm. and, you know, you have satellite images and all of that. So, yeah. uh, two questions, like, which arise in my mind, which might be interesting for the others as well. So, first, if there are any collaborations with NASA, and second, uh, do you know if in the future, you know, there is a curiosity uh, drone on the Mars, you know, mm -hmm. uh, uh, do you know if there are any plans to integrate these technologies into those type of drones like a curiosity? Because you remember uh, me and you once we heard about how they were coring on the Mars, right? Yeah. So, yeah. so they are quite you know, active in that direction. What about these type of technologies? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, great question. So actually, indeed, NASA is interested in the University of Houston. And we've had not just us, but also other research groups at U of H. Uh, we've had collaborations with NASA. We actually also have NASA people come and talk, you know, give regular talks in the university. You know, they come and talk about their exploration on Mars sometimes and, you know, climate on Earth and things like that. So we definitely have the connection with them. And uh, the, the cool thing is that NASA has a research grant just for remote sensing. So if you're a student, um, I think actually you have to be a, a US citizen to apply for NASA grants, if I'm, if I'm not, if I'm correct. Uh, but basically they have, you know, special funds just for these uh, type of studies. So it's, it's definitely possible. Um, and sometimes they can even provide their own, you know, very sophisticated tools if needed. Uh, in terms of Mars, uh, that's a great question. Um, I'm not, uh, I don't think uh, the, well, probably yes, drones are already used just, you know, to take images uh, of the Mars at closer scale. But um, one thing that it's definitely been used recently, and we saw some presentations on it, is ground penetrating radar. So they use this on, on the surface of Mars to kind of, you know, take very shallow subsurface, like one or two meters. Um, and kind of study the, the river, uh, the channels uh, in the, you know, on the surface of the Mars, which could indicate of, you know, previous or past uh, water activities on, on Mars. Uh, in terms of hyperspectral, I haven't seen it. But again, if, if there's any platform that can, you know, walk on Mars, then you can equip it with these tools. And they scan very quickly, like it takes one minute to just do one scan. So I, I definitely think it's possible. I think it's more a matter of, you know, cost and planning and things like that. Okay. Um, so, yeah. And then 
what, what can we do uh, with this, right, with the hyperspectral cameras? So again, as I told you, it collects the reflectance from the surface of the outcrop. And this reflectance is basically electromagnetic spect spectrum. And the cool thing about hyperspectral and the reason it's called hyper is because it literally collects thousands of bands in each spectrum, right? So you can get thousands of bands in the visible spectrum, thousands of bands in the near infrared and so on. So, and in the shortwave infrared. So using that, the near and shortwave infrared, which is where most of the minerals are reflecting, uh, we can map very detailed differences in mineralogy. So here, uh, this is what I've been doing for my research is, you can use different classification methods and then come up with, you know, models of the uh, surface mineralogy and then use that for, you know, characterization. Um, so once you do papers uh, or do some kind of research, you have the chance to apply to conferences and you can do this from Azerbaijan as well. Doesn't matter uh, where you are. Um, as long as you can write an abstract, you can submit it to, to, to a conference. And in Houston, we're really in, uh, in privilege because there is um, lots of conferences happening in Houston, both uh, international and local events. As I told you, the Houston is the energy capital of the world. So. Uh, all the you know industry and ac academia experts they come to these events. So uh, I'll tell you something cool. Actually, uh, when I was at the APG uh, annual conference uh, last year, I think yeah, uh, I met some of the professors that I was talking with uh, that I was talking with on the phone when I was up in Azerbaijan and applying. So it was you know it was cool to see people from all the way you know from California, from Colorado, and and so. On. Um, so in Houston, we have the, you know, the APG annual convention, the SP annual technical conference, SCG annual meeting, Society of Sedimentary Geologists meeting. We also have a local Houston Geological Society. It's also very popular and they have a lot of events and there's just many like hundreds of other uh, organizations just in Houston. Um, so yeah, so here's me presenting at the APG Student Expo and even in our own university, we have a local conference that we hold every year. It's called um, Annual Student Research Conference. Uh, we actually call it an open industry house because we invite people from the industry. So, you know, they can come, they can be the judges. So they watch the presentation and they judge you. And at the end, we all go together, you know, to a bar uh, to socialize and network. So it's a pretty cool event. Um, so once you, once you, you know, let's say you, you, you've done some research and um, you've presented your research a couple times, so you feel confident in, uh, in writing a paper and a PhD uh, comes with a certain requirements. So one of them is that uh, it consists of three chapters, so three research topics that are related to each other in some way. And one of these has to be, must be published and another one needs to be a submitted paper. So for me, for my published paper, um, this is the study I published in uh, Interpretation Journal uh, in, I think it was in January or yeah, I think sometime around January or February, it got published. And um, Interpretation is, is a journal by APG and SEG. It's a joint journal. And uh, I basically studied my results on, you know, uh, the mineral classification that you see here of the Mississippian limestone, uh, which is an unconventional reservoir uh, in, um, in Missouri, Oklahoma, uh, and Kansas. And um, yeah, so writing a paper is a very uh, meticulous and extensive process. You know, you begin with literature review in your introduction, you review all the uh, papers that have been done in this area, and then, you know, you write your methodology, what's new in your methodology, and what kind of results results you're bringing in. And this process, you know, writing can be quick or uh, it can be slow depending on uh, how much material you already have. But the entire um, application process and, you know, getting submitted and uh, approved, it can take, a, you know, half a year, a year, more than a year, two years, and that just depends uh, on the journal. So if you, if you come and you wanna do uh, your PhD or your master's, you should you know, start thinking about this um, early on to get it on time. And if anybody's interested, uh, there's a link here uh, to the paper. Then one more thing about the papers just quickly. So would you highlight also the benefits of having publications except 
it will help you to graduate as a PhD student? Uh, yeah, there, there are several benefits. Uh, one is uh, if you're willing to stay in academia and you, you want to go in, in the route of, you know, doing postdoc and then becoming a, eventually a professor, then this is a must, right? You need to show your, uh, your research background, your research capabilities, and a, uh, a published paper is the best example of that. So that's one. Second, it shows um, uh, just like from non-academic point of view, for anybody in the industry or in the geoscience community, it shows that uh, you are, uh, you have, during your PhD, you dedicated your time, you were able to manage your time and, you know, uh, dedicate your time to writing a, a paper, which is a very, you know, extensive process. So it just shows your, you know, uh, your efficiency as a student. Um, and third is uh, you get exposed to, so if you have a paper and you put it on research uh, gate or Google um, scholars or somewhere, uh, you expose yourself, you know, to the geoscience community. You share your paper, people read your paper, they will recommend you more papers or you will learn. So you get the chance to interact with other researchers and learn from them and they learn from you. So it's that interaction, you know, that you get with the academia. So like the general exposure. Right, and I guess it also helps also in uh, career in general, right? Not only academic, but uh, yeah, absolutely. Because yeah, when you do research, you learn so many uh, fine details uh, that that might come in handy, you know, when you're doing your work in the future. You're like, oh, I I remember, you know, I did this kind of you know detailed thing before, and it's it's definitely helpful because you end up reading so many papers and you you really learn a lot, and also. Uh, I actually had this point in my uh, concluding slide. Uh, when you read papers, you learn a lot of uh, new words and uh, you're just expanding your vocabulary. I think it's, it's really, really helpful to read papers. Okay, um, next slide, what do I have? So yeah, coursework. I know some people might be interested in what kind of geology subjects there are in the master's and uh, PhD program. So. Uh, just to just to be clear for everybody master and phd courses they're the same there's no distinction you can take uh actually there's there's no separation at all it's just a, a graduate course um so most of the schools um uh, you will have a requirement of to do uh three core courses uh, which is basically mandatory so you have to take them you must take them and then around five elective courses you can take more than five if you want, but this is like the minimum requirement is to have eight courses for a PhD program. And the rest uh, is basically research hours. So you take research hours every semester and you use those hours, um, you dedicate those hours towards your research, right? So this is time spent towards your research. So every semester you can take, let's say two courses and research hours. And it might look like, okay, two courses, you know, this is what I thought, this is nothing, you know, I'm gonna have so much time you know, to focus on the things I want. But these courses, each one of them, the homework part takes uh, a really, really long time because these are literally practical labs. So you're, you're almost doing like a small project for, for each homework. Um, so some of the coursework I have taken is remote sensing. So the reason I took this one is because it was directly related to my research, so for me to learn, and also geospatial analysis and applications, which is basically a GIS class. Um, I also took basin analysis for petroleum exploration. This is, again, one of the main classes for if you're interested in the petroleum industry. There is a petroleum prospecting workshop called IBA. This is actually a competition uh, course, and I will talk about this in a separate slide. Uh, sequence stratigraphy, important for geologists. Uh, seismic structural geology, this is basically studying st structural geology by looking at seismic sections. Uh, petroleum system analysis. This is a, basically a geochemistry class. So you study the geochemistry of shale rocks and uh, how to do basin modeling and calculate the volume of hydrocarbons in the basin. And uh, deep water facies in the field. Um, this is a field trip class. So you get to go to a field trip. I think we will go to California in September. It was actually delayed. It was supposed to be this August. Um, Sorry, this um, this may actually, yeah. But yeah, a field trip to California with some industry experts to, you know, look at deep water uh, de deposits. Um, 
that are you know currently explored in, uh, in, in the oil and gas companies. So one thing about this, the courses in the United States is that they all have a practical lab section. So each, almost each course has a lab section, uh, which is you either get a project and you work with software on a computer, let's say a petrol project, or uh, it will be a manual and you will be doing you know calculations on paper and, and things like that, that. But the important thing is that they're all the tasks that you're given, they're all applicable to the industry workflows. So you'll basically be working on things that you would do if you were to work uh, when you get to work to in the industry, in the industry. So it's really uh, useful and applicable. Um, so some of these classes, as I said, like the sequence stratigraphy and deep water fishes in the field, uh, they come with field trips. You know, field trips are important parts of the uh, geology programs in the United States. So here, this is our sequence stratigraphy graduate field trip to Wyoming uh, last year. Uh, yeah, we went to Wyoming for one week um, and we had Kurt Rudolph, uh, this guy here. He, he, he was the uh, previous global geoscientist for ExxonMobil for like the last 15 years. So it was really cool to have him with us and he was teaching us all about sequence stratigraphy and how it applies to uh, uh, exploring petroleum, you know, in the subsurface. Um, and another cool program is the summer undergraduate field camp. Uh, this is held every year in the summer. This is for undergraduate students and teaching assistants get to teach it in the summer. Um, so yeah, you can see the undergraduate geology students here. Um, they go, I think they usually go to a place called Big Bend uh, in Colorado or Utah, something like that. And then uh, they spend a week, uh, not, not, not a week, sorry. They spend actually a whole month just camping outside. And uh, they do geological mapping, measuring sections, uh, taking samples, um, building cross sections and all, all that kind of stuff. Just 30 days in the field every day. Um, teaching assistantship. So this is a very important part of my uh, of my graduate experience. This is the reason I'm actually able to come to the United States and a lot of the other international students as well. And so you can either get a teaching assistantship or a research assistantship. And that, that just de depends on the department, what kind of resources they have most and on your professor, you know, what is his uh, kind of his capabilities and his, his reach. Uh, can he do teaching, can he give a teaching assistantship or can he give a research assistantship, right? So the teaching assistantship, it comes from the department and the research assistantship comes directly from the professor himself, right? So what is a teaching assistantship? We call it TA shortly. Um, it's a part-time job, right? So you're basically an assistant who is helping a professor teach his course and you're literally teaching the, the lab section of that course. So he's teaching the lecture section, you're teaching the lab section, right? And for example, this semester I was teaching GIS class. I had 60 undergraduate students and also some, some graduate students. And some of the responsibilities include preparing a syllabus, uh, the class material, uh, preparing exams, uh, most importantly, grading those exams and proctoring. Proctoring is when, you know, let's say, so the undergraduate classes are really big uh, in the United States. They can be between 200 and 300 undergraduate students in one classroom at one time. So when they, when they have exams, you can imagine how, how many, you know, how uncontrollable it can get. So usually they call TAs and we basically walk around the classroom and <laughs> kind of make sure that the students don't cheat. You know, it's called uh, proctoring. And, um, Apart from doing all of this, you know, apart from teaching 20 hours per week, preparing exams, uh, grading, you still have to do research and you still have to take your own classes. So uh, just because you're a teaching assistant doesn't mean you don't get to do those. You actually get to do more than uh, anyone else in the department, even more than the research assistants because you're still doing uh, research and you're still doing coursework. But it, com it definitely comes with uh, privileges, right? So you get your full tuition gets covered and all other mandatory fees get covered. So you literally get every resource on campus for free, including insurance, gym, uh, and all the other things, right? Uh, you get considered as faculty or staff. So you get some of their benefits as well. 
you know, faculty sometimes they get get get, get invited to special events, so you can get go there as a TA. Um, you get your own office in your research group. Um, this is my personal office. Um, you can customize it however you want. Um, right now, you don't see any computer here, but usually uh, they, you also get a computer. I just took mine home uh, when the pandemic happened and they closed the school, so I just brought it home. But usually you will also have uh, like two monitors. And you can see here, I have my APG stuff because I was the president for the student chapter. So I had all the stuff uh, held at my uh, office. And uh, probably the biggest benefit is the, the monthly salary, uh, which you use for your uh, living costs, right? Uh, like actual job salary. And the, uh, I've had the chance, so the courses you teach, again, it depends on your background. Um, you know, the coordinator, the TA coordinator will assign which course you will be teaching but that kind of will be based on your background. For me, I had the chance to teach a different class each semester, so I think that's pretty cool. In the first semester, I taught physical geology, which is for undergrads, petroleum geology, which was mixed class between undergraduates and graduates. Then I taught uh, petroleum geoscience specifically for uh, petroleum engineers um, and geospatial analysis and applications, which is the uh, GIS class. Uh, so the Imperial Battle Award, um, this is a course that you can take where in the, when you study uh, in, in graduate school and not just in the United States, uh, this is available in many countries. I hope uh, sometime this can be made available in, you know, in Azerbaijan as well through the AAPG student chapters. So what is this about? This is a international petroleum exploration contents. I actually didn't know how big this event is when I first joined, but it's, um, it's 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 a huge event, and uh, when this happens, everybody's literally just talking about this, right? And it's so big that industry people, when you go to interview or to a job, they want to see if you've had this experience. So it's a really good way to to expose yourself um, to the industry, especially as an international student. If you do this as an international student. Um, this will be really good for you because uh, for international students, it's really hard to get to get noticed. And I'm not saying that to to discourage everyone. I'm just saying what what the uh, re reality is. Uh, as an international student, you have to do more than anybody else uh, to get noticed and recognized. So, in this program, uh, there's 200 you know, more than 200 universities involved globally. Um, so you get two months, and you get seismic and well log data and you work on a project for two months. It's kind of like an internship. So every day for eight weeks, you work on this project. And it's sponsored and judged by industry experts. And there's two rounds, like there's a regional round and there's a global round. So in the regional round, you compete with the universities in your region. Um, and then if you win that one, you go to the global and compete with the winners of the regional from other parts of the world. Um, so the team consists of five students, uh, graduate students. We had uh, master's and, and PhD students. Uh, I was the captain uh, of our team and we worked literally 10 hours per day for two months. And this is, you know, apart from other regular duties like teaching, um, uh, taking your own courses and all that stuff, right? Writing papers, doing your research, everything. Uh, and then also working on this project. So professors actually do not recommend to take this course if you're in your final year and you are, let's say, working on your thesis or dissertation because this is gonna take too much time from that. So yeah, you get seismic and well data. We got uh, basically uh, the North Carnarvon Basin. It's located in the Northwestern coast of Australia offshore Australia, which is basically like relatively underexplored area. So you get the seismic and well data and your task is to interpret it and come up with a prospect and where to drill an exploration well. What is your recommendation basically? And some of the roles for each of the members, they include, so some of, someone, one of us was doing basin modeling. The other one was doing structural and tectonic interpretation. I was doing uh, petrophysics and a little bit of uh, geophysics. And someone, you know, someone else was doing sedimentology and reservoir type stuff. So the, 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 the regional competition we had in Gulf Coast, it was held in uh, Anadarko company. Uh, maybe you've heard about this company. They last year, actually right after our competition, one month later, uh, Accidental bought this company. 
so they became part of Occidental. And yeah, we competed with the, so in our region, our region is called Gulf Coast. So the universities that are in our region, region our region is the biggest. So we had 11 universities, right? There was Texas A&M, University of Texas at Austin, uh, University of Houston. Um, then there is uh, Colorado School of Mines, Louisiana State University, um, Louisiana, uh, University of Louisiana at Lafayette, and you know those those universities in near the you know southeast border of the United States, uh, near the Gulf of Mexico. So yeah, we won the first place here, and we get uh, 50, we got like fifteen hundred dollars, and then we went to the Globals, and the cool thing about it is you actually get to go to the APG annual conference. Uh, which was held in San Antonio last year. And you compete there with all the winners of the of the world. And again, here we got the first place. And this was a huge event, you know, all of the, you know, industry experts and academia people were there to see. And the award was, you know, uh, $20,000. And half of this went to our student chapter to support the activities of our student uh, students so that was really cool and uh, the biggest thing is you get shared in you know a lot of different places you know we got shared in the APG Explorer Journal on the University of Houston main uh, web page um, we even had a radio appearance and there was like just lots of networking opportunities which is really important if you want to get a job uh, or an internship in the United States you need to network this is a, a must in the United States uh, in terms of uh, student organizations, just in our in our department, we have uh, six uh, six student organizations, um, and we also have SBE. SBE is actually not part of our department; it's part of the Petroleum Engineering Department. Uh, we don't. Uh, if you have if you have the question, if we collaborate, we don't really collaborate with them too much. Our departments are kind are kind of disconnected, but. Uh, we always keep, you know, each other open. So if there's like a joint event that we can do together, we will. But usually everything happens, you know, separately. So I was, so we have the APG student chapter called Wildcatters. So the student chapters here, they actually have their own names, which I think is cool. Uh, there's the SCG student chapter called Wavelets, you know, like the seismic wavelets. And Wildcatters is like, when you drill an exploration well, you're, you're kind of like a wildcatter, right? And then Geosociety. So these two, they're for graduates, so masters and PhD. The Geosociety is for undergraduates. So it's like another society that, that does activities for them. Uh, there's also like American Institute of Professional Geologists, environmental uh, geologists, uh, and even we have a meteorological society as well. So I was the president of uh, the APG student chapter uh, from 2019 to 2020. I just finished in May. Um, and some of the things we do, it's kind of pretty similar to what you guys do in, uh, in, in Azerbaijan. Uh, so, but we have more officers. We had like nine officers. And throughout the year, we organized, you know, talks, workshops, and uh, something that we do different that I think we don't get to do a lot in Azerbaijan is social events. So... Uh, here on the left side, we had one of the biggest events. This is called Software Bootcamp. So we invited people from Schlumberger and Structure Solver, and they came and taught. We had a five-day workshop. So each day they taught a different module on either Petrel or Petromod. And, you know, we had the students in our computer room just, you know, watching and doing uh, as the instructor was teaching. Um, then uh, we had a technical talk on salt tectonics. Um, again, salt, salt tectonics is big in the Gulf of Mexico. So it's a popular topic that we did. And we invited Carl Fiduk. He's the, he's the industry expert in this area. Um, then we had a technical talk on deep water reservoirs. Again, another hot topic. And we had Dr. Uh, John Rosian from uh, Stanford who came and um, talked about um, deep water dep deposits and reservoirs and social events. Like we usually have like regular social events where we just go to a bar or a pub um, just to like uh, get drinks and food and, you know, uh, socialize with, with your fellow mates. And also we invite faculty members. So sometimes faculty members also come. And every year we hold a holiday party. Uh, it's kind of a big fun event where we invite all the alumni of the of our department so anyone from the past 10 years and we invite uh 
faculty and the students. And then, yeah, we basically organized a whole holiday party for, for everyone. And it was just a, like a really cool, fun event. You know, you get food, drinks, uh, some games and stuff. It's just a good way to stay connected uh, with people. And I think that's one thing I would recommend for the chapters in Azerbaijan as well. Uh, so in terms of career fairs, right? So recruitment season, uh, uh, it's a very, very intense season. <laughs> and as an international student, I have it written here, yeah. As an international student, you need to be on top of the game to be noticed, right? Because international students, they're faced with a major problem, which is uh, sponsorship. You need, you need you need visa sponsorship to be able to work in the United States. So you need uh, you need sponsorship from the industry and not all companies can do this for you, right? Not all companies have the resources to apply for a work visa for you. So you have to be uh, uh, kind of exceptional, you know, uh, among your peers. So the recruitment season is intense. We actually, you know, among the students in our department, we call the hunting season <laughs> because this is when uh, you literally go out and you hunt for jobs every day for like for one month. And the thing is, it begins early semester, so you have to be prepared. So let's say you joined, uh, you got accepted to the US and you joined. So the classes will start mid August and the recruitment season will begin September 1st. So you literally have two weeks to get all your stuff together. You just arrive and in two weeks you will be in the recruitment season. And so what happens during this season, right? There is several career fairs. Uh, some of them are held at the college level at your department, but there's also campus wide events. So like the, a career fair for all of the majors across the campus. And the cool thing is the companies, and I'm talking about like big name companies, they come directly to the campus. So they just come to the campus and you get the chance to uh, go up to them and talk with them, right? Uh, before before holding the career event, first they come to your department and they give an info session where they just talk about their company um, and you can ask your que any questions you have, you know, about their internship programs or full-time opportunities. And it's it's hundreds of students competing for internships. And this all of these students, they have either a master's degree or PhD degree. So you can imagine how big of a competition it, it is. Actually, uh, like as a joke between ourselves, we call each other enemies, you know, during this, this one month. And after this one month, we will become friends again, just of how <laughs> competitive uh, it gets. Um, so... Uh, yeah, you have a career fair, like you can see here. So the companies will have their own stand and you literally just get in line um, and you wait for your turn uh, to walk up to the company, to bring in your resume and, you know, kind of introduce yourself and talk about uh, their opportunities. So you can see, so this is the APG Student Expo last year that was held in Houston. You can see he, me standing here in line. It can take up to like five hours, just this one event, just standing in lines and talking to all different um, stands of companies. So it's a very tiring event, but at the same time, it's very exciting because you're seeing all the big name companies and company representatives in there. So some of the tips I have that I've learned um, from my uh, two years here in the United States is you just have to be proactive from first day of school um, you have to attend all info sessions, right? You need to show yourself as much as possible. Uh, get involved with student organizations from early on. You know, part of the reason how I got to become the president is because I was going to all of the events in the first year. Um, and then uh, you have to keep your LinkedIn professional in the United States. Uh, I think already in Azerbaijan as well. But specifically in the United States, it's a huge platform. So everybody is on this platform. And if you don't have a professional profile there, you're kind of uh, left out, right? And you have to keep it updated. You have to make posts, you have to share your success and, and things like that to, be, to, to stay relevant, uh, basically. Um, attend all relevant career fairs. Don't just go to your department one, also go to the campus one. Even though there might not be all the companies you want at the campus wide event, there might still be something, uh, some opportunity there as well. So just don't think that I don't need it. Just go, uh, make time for it and go. It's important to carry a resume at all times during your graduate studies. And not a lot of people have cover letter. 
but if you have a cover letter, it's going to be really, it's going to make you different from others because not many people have it. And it's just like a, a story version of your resume, basically. And one thing I learned in the United States is that students, especially graduate students, they have their own business cards. So I previously, I thought, you know, this is only for people who are already working, like young professionals or, you know, industry experts or people with business. But in, in the U.S., uh, everyone carries a business card. And I think it's a really cool thing. First of all, it's fun to do your own business card. And when it comes printed, it's kind of you, you get excited to see your card. And whenever you go to these conferences and all of these career fairs or info sessions, it's really easy to just take it outside of your pocket and hand it to someone after you talk with them. And this way they will, they will remember you. You know, If you hand out, let's say, 50 cards, maybe five of them you know, will remember you when they go home and they put their card down. You know. Um, you have to practice something that's called uh, elevator speech. Uh, it's called elevator because imagine if you get into an elevator with someone and you, let's say you're going to some floor together, you have to, what would you say if you started talking? Like, this is your elevator speech. How would you introduce yourself in 30 seconds? So it's a good thing to practice before you go to this event so that when you come up to the stand and you say hi to the person, you know what, what's the next sentences you're going to say, how to quickly introduce yourself and not talk too much, but also say enough to outline your background. Um, and you should attend events outside of the university. Don't just be, uh, uh, don't just be restricted to the things that are happening to university. I know all of this sounds like a lot, and it actually is. There's a lot of things happening when you're doing uh, graduate studies. It's not just about studying and doing research. It's about building and maintaining a meaningful network. Uh, so you just have to be proactive and you should be attending events outside of the university, like the student expos and um, conferences, which is where you get to meet people outside of your scope uh, of people that you see every day. Right. Uh, and then the people you meet, you go and you add them on LinkedIn and that's how you build a meaningful network, not just a random collection of uh, connections on, on LinkedIn. Um, so let's say you attended all of these events and let's say out of the 20 events that you attended, two companies or one company reached out to you and they invited you to an interview. Um, so this is already an achievement. If you get an interview in the United States, this is a big achievement. It means you're just one step closer to getting your um, internship or your full-time offer, right? So the interviews can be different. They can be directly on campus. So let's say the recruiter comes to an info session and he likes you and he tells you, okay, I'm gonna come here tomorrow at 2 p.m. Uh, let's meet in this room. So you literally have an interview on campus the next day. There can be office interviews. Um, so this is when like officially the recruiter invites you to their company, to their office and you interview there. There can be online interviews where everything happens online. You just apply and then uh, uh, you get invited to an interview and basically you record yourself uh, answering to some questions. So it's like a video interview. Uh, in rare occasions, I haven't heard much about this, but there can also be phone interviews where they just call you on the phone and ask you the questions through the phone. And very rarely, um, it can happen without interviews, just based on a recommendation. When let's say a professor or someone in the industry just recommends you and uh, you get called just without an interview. So that can also happen. Uh, some of the tips I have uh, for anyone who is doing interviews anywhere in the world, not just in the United States, is first, read about the company. I know you've probably heard this a lot, but it's, it's important to know what's the mission of this company. And do you see yourself in this company for the next, uh, you know, long-term period, right? 10 years, 15 years. Um, review their values. So each company should have its own values. And don't just memorize their values, but try to relate it to yourself. Um, see which one of their values you relate to the least, like you don't feel like you have that value a lot, and which one you relate to the most, which one you practice a lot in, you, in your daily life. It's a, it's a good way to, to review their, uh, their values. Uh, just be yourself. You probably heard this a lot. But it's probably the most important thing is the more you over the more you think about how you should act during an interview, the more robotic you will be, and it will not it will just not go smooth. So just be yourself. 
Um, practice soft skills, uh, be outspoken. This is very important in the United States. You have to be able to communicate with people. You have to be able to share a funny story, you know, if, if, uh, if there's a need for that, you know. And you have to be able to effectively communicate your background. But apart from all of this, at the end of the day, you have to be strong uh, technically. And I think an important thing is to show your passion. Like when you answer questions, you need to show that you're actually really excited about this topic. And so following all of the steps that I talked in the previous slides for the professional activities, um, I got uh, internship offers from uh, uh, BP and Shell uh, located in Houston. And I'm currently doing my internship with BP. Uh, unfortunately, uh, we can no longer do it in the office, in the headquarters in Houston at the Energy Corridor, uh, because because of pandemic, everything you know switched to virtual. So we're just doing a virtual uh, internship instead. Um, so I'd like to conclude my talk. I probably talked a lot. I'm sorry for that, <laughs> but um, I'd like to say if you have a, if you want to have a successful graduate experience abroad. Uh, just uh, there's some things that you have to learn before coming to the United States and that is learn to become independent and this applies to both uh, school and life because here you will be pretty much on your own like everything you will be doing it, it will be just you like on yourself so you have to be independent in school and also in life be able to make decisions um, Learn to manage your time and multitask. I mean, from all of my slides, you probably saw how many things there are, how many moving parts there are to a graduate uh, uh, study, right? It's not just studies and research, it's also teaching and networking and going to all kinds of events and keeping a busy calendar. So you have to learn to manage your time and be able to multitask, especially like when you're writing a paper that takes so much time. Um, Set a vision for yourself with short and long-term goals. If you don't have a goal during your graduate career, you're gonna feel lost. You, you're gonna feel like, uh, what am I doing here? Am I doing the right thing? Uh, so it's, I think it's actually easy to lose focus. So just always set a vision for yourself. Um, just put some short, short-term goals, like for the next year or two years or for the next month, and some long-term goals. Like after I finish my graduate studies, what do I wanna do? You know. Do I want to stay here and explore my opportunities or do I want to, you know, go back and explore my opportunities there? So that's something to keep in mind even before you apply. Um, courses are important. Obviously, you need to take courses um, and you, you will learn a lot from these courses just, you know, just simply from the lab portion of the, of the courses and from the homework. But essentially, it's about research, right? You come to graduate school to do research. So that should be the main focus. Um, it's important to keep a good, good GPA. Like if your GPA is 4 or 3.9, that's excellent. That will make you, that will distinguish you from everybody else. But at the same time, if you have all, let's say you have perfect uh, grades, right? And then you don't have any research activity or you're very slow on your research, then you're basically failing your, your graduate school. You're not doing what you came here to do. Uh, but if you have both, if you have both, you know, a strong GPA and a research and a paper, that's, that puts you in the front really. Uh, and people start noticing you. Uh, read lots of academic papers. Uh, this is to expand your technical knowledge. We already touched upon this and also vocabulary, right? When you come here, you're going to be hearing a lot of academic words. So it's, it's good to, to learn those before, beforehand. Take examples from the best and set your own. When I came here, there were some really, really strong students in the upper classes. And for me, the way I've always done it is I want to learn from people who are in the, in the upper classes and kind of ask them what kind of things they did, you know, to get to that position. And then I will try to do it from my first year. And uh, so basically you, you take examples from the best, you follow them, and then you start setting your own examples for the next students that come. And it's important to help others, right? Uh, when you help others, you also learn. Uh, it's not just sharing information, but you're also learning from them. And uh, again, as I mentioned, get involved. Don't just be in your office all day, every day, um, so that nobody sees you. Uh, get involved, uh, get involved with student chapters, go to events inside and outside of the university, make friends. It's very important to make friends and build meaningful connections, right? Not just a random collection, but a meaningful 
collection of uh, connections. Uh, and with that, I'd like to conclude. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. I'm sorry if I talk too much. Uh, I hope that was useful. Uh, before I finish and give it off to questions, I want to say that I think the students in Azerbaijan are in a uh, really good and very, very good and unique position because uh, we, uh, you guys there, you get direct support from the industry. You know, the SBE uh, organization, it has direct support from the industry to students in Azerbaijan. So I think that's very cool and just take advantage of that. I think all of the uh, SPE chapters and APG and SEG chapters in, in Azerbaijan are doing a, a really, really good job. Uh, I actually think it's even on a higher level than the chapters that we have here uh, because of how, many, how much activity I'm seeing on, you know, on, on the social media. Uh, so just keep doing that and special congratulations to the ASOI chapter for getting the excellence award. I think that's a really great representation of your, uh, of your success. Just one thing I would suggest is uh, try to make your profiles on LinkedIn even bigger than they are. Just make them more active because LinkedIn is where you're going to get um, exposure from other parts of the world, right? So just try to increase your activity on LinkedIn, I would suggest. And with that, uh, please ask any questions you have, whether it's from my slides or any personal question that you might have. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I also join the congratulations you mentioned and uh, I would <clears throat> uh, thank uh, you for the recommendations you made to chapters. Actually, if you don't mind, I will read questions which you write in the chat. So uh, one question was that, is it mandatory to have research experience to study in the University of Houston? Mm. Uh, that's a good question. So I would say, I personally would say yes, uh, because um, you need to have something to show to the professor. So when you're applying, right, obviously you apply first through the university. So you go online, you fill out the application, blah, blah, blah. But uh, essentially all of your communication is with the, with the professor, right? So you write an email to the professor, you call the professor and your your chance to get accepted and get a teaching assistantship or a research assistantship is dependent on that professor so think about it what are you going what are you going to show to your professor because everybody is going to have a good uh, uh gre score everybody's going to have a good ielts or toefl score everybody will have a good um uh, gpa you know all of these things are standard so everyone will have this you're not going to be the only one who has like the perfect scores, um, especially, you know, with all the students coming abroad, you know, just not, not just Azerbaijan, there's everyone applying to United States. So you need to have something that distinguishes you and that's research um, because that's what the professor wants from you. He wants, he wants you to be able to come and do research, but don't think that you need to have a, a research paper or you need to be at a conference. Uh, if, if there's any topic that you have uh, reviewed or read about, or you've made a presentation about, it can be just a review, you know, it doesn't have to be something new. Uh, just anything that you have, let's say, an extensive knowledge in, and you can maybe prepare a poster, right? You can make a poster about, let's say, I'm, I'm just throwing a topic like uh, 3D tomography, or I don't know, like, yeah, like 3D tomography, just make a poster of, of, of what you've read about and your review. And when you call the professor, that's something you can talk about. So I would say it's not mandatory to do uh, like the research itself, but it's good to know what research is about. And it's, uh, it's good to review at least uh, some topics and so that you have something to present uh, to the professor. I think that... It, it's and also doing research is use, useful for yourself because when you come to United States, that's what you're going to be doing. So at least you have to know the process of how uh, research works. Uh, the next question is also, uh, I mean, a set of questions I would say uh, comes here is like uh, about your background. How uh, did you get accepted to Houston? Uh, that's one point. Second is like how difficult it is to go directly uh, to PhD from, from bachelor? Mm. Yeah, good question. So 
my uh, the way I got admitted to uh, to University of Houston yeah so this will be different for every person obviously there's not one standard tr treatment for everyone for me I've been planning this ever since I was a kid like from five years old I've been learning English uh, I've been taking part in exchange programs in the United States and things like that. But it really began uh, for me during my second year in bachelor's. I joined the Young Talents uh, School from SBE. And this is when I met a lot of the SBE people and started you know, uh, taking courses. And then I got involved with research, uh, with the EI Link uh, uh, Research and Development Center. Um, in my second year of undergraduate, right? So for me, uh, I've been doing research for two years already in my undergraduate. So I worked on a couple projects. Uh, I got to write uh, a few papers, uh, got to go to conferences abroad and present. So uh, I had a lot of material to share with the professor. You know, I had, I, I had a lot of material to share. And then obviously, you know, taking the exams, the GRE, the TOEFL, uh, all that stuff. So the way I applied is uh, I'm a geologist. So I was looking for schools that are known for petroleum geology. And these are Colorado School of Mines, UT Austin, Texas A&M, University of Houston, uh, University of Utah, Tulsa, Louisiana State University, things like that. So don't limit yourself in your applications. Just um, apply to several schools and as I, as I said for me the process was first I would go to the website uh, of the department of the geology department I would look at their activities and then I would go through the entire list of professors all of the professors in that department and from them I would look at the professors that are doing research work that I'm interested in and who I can contact and present what I have um, so for me, that was Dr. Shukab Khan from the University of Houston. He was doing um, reservoir characterization on outcrop analogs. So I thought that was relevant for me. So I just wrote him an email, right? Uh, in that email, I included my papers uh, that I had. I had my PDF, the PDFs of my papers, uh, my resume, uh, my GRE and um, IELTS and TOEFL scores, and. Uh, my GPA. So I kind of shared everything with him that I have in the email. And I talked a little bit about my background, uh, what kind of research I've done. And it's very important to tell the professor why you're interested in him and why exactly like this department. So in that email, you kind of write uh, that, you know, I've read your paper. I'm really interested in this, in this topic. I want to do something similar. And here's my background. I think it's relevant. Do you think there's any uh, research opportunities with you and then you know after a week you call him and then you kind of expand on this conversation and take it on from there so for me again it was doing research when I was in Azerbaijan being involved with SP student chapters uh, it, it kind of like the things that I already showed you on my slides it was already happening for me in Azerbaijan, you know, I was already doing all of this, being involved with uh, student chapters, doing research, writing papers, going to conferences, presenting. When you have all of this material, it becomes uh, very easy to talk to a professor. So definitely get involved. Oh, and the second question was, um, how hard it is to get into PhD straight after bachelor's. So in the, in the, in the US, uh, there is no such distinction. Uh, you can literally apply uh, straight to master's or straight to bachelor, uh, straight to PhD. Uh, obviously, if you ab apply to PhD, you need to show more of your research activity. So for PhD program, it will be important to have, re it, it, I guess it will be mandatory to have research experience if you want to get admitted straight to PhD. But in terms of the application process and all of the things that you have to do, it's exactly the same as for master's. Uh, Again, you just have to, I guess, have that research experience that shows the professor that you can do PhD. Great. Um, so I'm wondering if there are any other questions. Yes, go ahead. So uh, there are, there is one person typing in the chat, I guess, or I mean, feel free to ask uh, with your audio if you wish.
Meanwhile, others uh, also. Any ideas, suggestions, wishes to add? Uh, yes, of course. Go ahead and uh, ask an audio. Absolutely. Hi, Aydin. Can you can, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Who is this? Uh, my name is Oman. I'm from Tashkent SP section. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you very much for the presentation. It was great. I got to know a lot of uh, useful and valuable valuable information about Houston and your background. My question was uh, about graduate corporate graduate programs. Have you heard of uh, such corporate graduate programs in uh, big oil companies like BP, Shell, or others? Uh, uh, okay, correct me if I'm wrong. Are you talking about when you're already working for a company and they're paying for your graduate studies? N no, this is something like uh, when you apply to this and they actually accept you to the job, but you uh, get, uh, yeah. you know, but you get education yes. simultaneously yeah. at the yeah. site. I've, I've heard of people who've done that, um, but usually those people are already, I think, the ones who've been in the United States for some times. I haven't heard of anybody who was abroad and then got accepted to a job and they sent him to study, if that makes sense. I haven't, I haven't heard of somebody like that. Maybe there is, but I guess that would be a very rare, rare uh, uh, condition uh, because you would either have to have a lot of I guess, and a, a job experience from your country, right? Let's say, let's say you're working for Schlumberger for some time and then you start talking with people in Schlumberger in the United States and maybe through that communication, you can get something. But I think if you're a student and I don't know how you would get directly a job from the United States, if that makes sense. Uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, what, what I wanted uh, to tell is that I didn't really want to do master's or PhD and there was this question is it possible uh, to study in the US without research uh, background which was really relevant to me I'm not re very much into research but uh, I like to study as well um, so I just wanted to know if it's possible to get a job not only in the United States but in other parts of the world uh, you know into those corporate graduate programs how likely it is like uh, how likely it is to get to those with uh, with a background that is actually good, but it doesn't have any research mm -hmm. component in it. I see, I see. So, um, so he here's something, right? In the U.S., research is important uh, because it comes from a, a graduate program. It comes from a master's program or a PhD program. In the U.S., if you're undergraduate, you can get a job. And the the problem is you will not be able to advance in your job you will stay at a, a, a very low grade. So that's why even Americans like US citizens, they go ahead and they do their master's and PhD just to be able to have that one level of distinction to keep them going forward in their, in their career. Um, so having master's and PhD is not a requirement, but it's like 100% recommended if you, want to, uh, if you want to get a good job basically and you want to be in a good position with the company and be able to advance. So like the undergraduates, they're mostly in doing like uh, field technical work in service companies or some geotechnical work, things like that. Uh, whereas graduate students are your, like your regular uh, exploration or development geologists, right? Um, so, it, so just because of that, I would say it's important to get a degree, a master's and PhD, and that will involve having research uh, one way or the other. Uh, but if you want to, like, without having the research experience, get directly uh, into, you know, a job abroad, that will just have to come from your personal communications. Like people you know abroad, they will have to help you. Uh, they will have to connect you with someone in their company and then where you can, you know, present your background and see if that's, um, if that's enough for them. But I haven't, again, I haven't heard of many, many cases like this. So I think it's, it's not very likely. That makes sense. I, Thank you very I don't, much. I don't, yeah. I don't want to disco discourage. I'm just saying what, what I think is happening right now. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you yeah. very much. Sure. Okay. Uh, any other comments or questions? Uh, I think there are none. So 
as we mentioned, this video was recorded uh, for others to use. So, uh, I mean, I'd be why I'm going to use it. For me, it's also, you know, seems to be a good brochure for students and young professionals as well, you know. You have yeah. shared uh, general things, not only related to Houston uh, University. So from our side, I, then we, I, once again, I would like to thank you a lot for dedicating the time for us and uh, for not keeping, uh, forgetting the Azerbaijan and folks here. Uh, we wish, uh, all of us wish you good luck with your internship, uh, which you are doing, the, doing the virtually. Probably your generation is the first one who uh, will be doing it, you know, on the online. <laughs> yeah, I think so. <laughs> Uh, and maybe uh, first and last, who knows? But yeah, <laughs> I mean, hopefully last, yeah. Uh, but it's definitely uh, from the stories which you will be telling your grandchildren in the future. Uh, so, yeah, wishing you good luck with that. Uh, also, keep feeding us uh, with ideas and suggestions. I hope, like our participants, also. Uh, may uh, drop you into their uh, network expansion. Program. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. So if you would like to reach Aiden anyhow, just, you know, uh, contact the SP folks or directly Aiden Shaftakinsky on his uh, LinkedIn profile. Uh, so that being said, we passed like one and a half uh, hour. Oh, uh, wow. Yeah, it flies, uh, flies for me quite you know, uh, like in a one blink. So, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, I, absolutely. I I enjoy talking about uh, talking about this, and um, I'm I'm, you know, every day I'm following uh, what is happening with the SP chapters in Azerbaijan. You know, on social media, and just keep it up. It's great work. Yeah, uh, thank you, thank you for your uh, kind words, uh, and we are looking forward. I I'm pretty sure somewhere in the future we will have a. Maybe uh, even personal meetings when you land up sometime in Azerbaijan, or we will keep going with online. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, that's why I tell you, see you. Uh, <laughs> and uh, yeah, keep safe. You too, you too, guys. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye.